okay, folks, I won't give you a number because we're still doing Holly shorts. So we'll just say it's like 12, 15. I'm not quite sure because I'm so enamored and excited with everybody that comes on here today. Special guest, his name is Dylan Boom, did a lovely little film, 15 minutes long called Elevate. So Dylan, welcome. I have many questions. Thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. Um, so I am shameless about going all over the place trying to find interesting facts to talk about. So let's talk about your dad. Let's talk about the fact that he sells coffee. I'm guessing he still does. How did you find that out? I'm a that's journalist. Amazing. Wow, that's that's great. Yeah, yeah, he does still owns a coffee company called Boom Brothers Coffee. You can look them up. They're based in Wisconsin, but they sell online. They uh, He sells wholesale to uh, restaurants and stuff. So yeah. Still doing it. I still do, got a few bags in the house. Oh, that's awesome. Do we have yeah. a website or a way that we can visit Dad's Coffee? Of course. Boombrothers.com. Boombrotherscoffee.com, I believe. I mean, just type in Boom Brothers Coffee to Google. You'll find it. I haven't been on the website in a bit. But oh, that's, um, that's really cool because, yeah. I, you know, there's not a lot of people that I, I mean, I interview people that have businesses of sorts, but I'm like a coffee business. That's kind of cool. Um, how did he get started with that? Seriously, because that's awesome. Yeah, didn't think we'd be talking about this. this is great. I, I don't know how you found that out, but it, it's my my dad started it with my uncle back in the day. That was kind of like the inception. That's why it's called Boom Brothers. And then my uncle yeah. left. And yeah, he's he's done it pretty much since I've been alive. So you know, I'm 30, and it was probably God. I want to say 20 plus years he's been doing it. So oh, wow. yeah, still going. Yeah. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah. Now, do you anticipate that you could still do filmmaking and one day take over the coffee business? Is that like the plan here? My plan would be not to take over the coffee business, but for him to be able to retire. So like if someone could buy out the business or I buy out the business and sell it to someone else. I mean, that's a, that's the dream. I've told him before, you know, I, I would love to like pay off his mortgage and let him just live a life that, where he doesn't have to work anymore. I think everyone wants to do that, you know, for their parents. Absolutely. You betcha. <clears throat> now, before we get off of dad, I have to ask the obvious question because it seems as though you have a lovely adoration for him. What are his thoughts? Because I know parents have a tendency to be a little over insecure and a little overly worried, you know, when you say, hey, I'm going to direct for a living or I'm going to be in the arts for a living. They get worried, you know, because some parents wonder, you know, can you live on this? Are you going to do well? So what was their reaction when you decided to start transitioning? to this career that's a great question I think it's evolved it's never been it, I will say this he never and my mom goes with my mom as well they were never against it you know what I mean they were never like not positive and supportive of me pursuing my dreams but with that being said you know I moved out to California when I was 19 so it was very you know in hindsight now 10 years later I can understand their trepidations and and sure. worriness of me coming out here. But I think they were always a little concerned of like how I'm going to make it work, but it's gotten past the point now on year 10, me being out here where they've kind of been like, they get it now. And it's on, now they understand it. Obviously there's, you know, peaks and valleys as far as, you know, financial woes and surpluses as far as like for everyone in times where it's still been good or not as good. But I think more in recent memory in the last couple years with the films of mine that have actually you know done okay or, or maybe a job here and there that I've actually gotten paid to do something filmmaking related whether it's writing or anything that's kind of where the click has gone in their in their head to be like oh this is actually finally paying off and it's all it's all been really supportive honestly there I'm, I'm super nice. fortunate to have them and I think I'm also clearly a child of theirs because they are film lovers as well my mom and my dad they oh. love the movies like crazy so this is yeah. very cool awesome now yeah. i'm super excited to report that dylan used to live in shorewood wisconsin which coincidentally is exactly nine minutes from where i'm sitting right now i live in glendale you do where glendale Shut is, right? up. No i live way. on the river i'm looking at the river oh, right now so cool. i live in glendale wisconsin so we Glendale people, there's this whole, just you folks know to give you some backstory here. The people refer to us, some of us as not me, but North Shore Nancy's because we live in this nice mm -hmm. neighborhood. Shorewood's a nice neighborhood. One of my best friends is a musician that actually lives in Shorewood right now. So it's okay. ironic. I'm yeah. like, I'm, I'm big team Shorewood. And rumor okay. has it that you might be a fan of Giannis Santacupo or the Green Bay of Packers. Course. Is that not right? Oh my God. Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, I mean, I was just listening to a Packers, Packers podcast this morning, so um, ah! yeah, still a huge, <laughs> a huge Packer fan. Giannis obviously uh, has put the stamp on the city and 
he's put eyes on the city that we didn't have before. So that was great. Sorry, I think someone's looking. Sorry, one second. But yeah, so it's been pretty awesome, honestly, with with all that. Yeah, I mean, I I just love, I love it. It's a sports town, and I can't, I can't take that out of you know my DNA. Yeah, well, I can't believe yeah. I can't believe you're in Glendale. That's unbelievable. Well, I mean, you know, that's and you speak to a very valid point, which is most people that talk about Wisconsin automatically think about the sports side of things, cheese curds, Wisconsin beer, all that good stuff. But the trade off to that is, you know, arts and, and media and, you know, entertainment and film. It's a little lighter on that side. So it's a little harder. So, of course, I had to establish my yeah. career as you are outside of here, you know, New York and other places, et cetera. But I have a Giannis question for you. So what's your take on Giannis becoming an executive producer and making that film? I'm like, that's kind of cool, the crossover between sports and entertainment there with Rise. Yeah, I mean, it's his story. I feel like he should have been an executive producer in that way, right? Like, if, you know, if he what? wasn't, yeah, that would have been weird if, they, if someone else kind of like took the reins and was just like, yeah, we're going to make this film. I mean, I know that happens sometimes where they're not EPs on projects, right. but... Yeah, I love it. I still haven't seen it, actually. It's kind of one of those things where it's like, I know the story so well at this point where I'm like, I don't know if I want to see it, but sure. I would, I should watch it to support him for sure. Absolutely. You love betcha. So before sure we move off of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, since we're both very yeah. familiar with that, I know that two things happened here that you were excited about. First of all, I know you played the Wisconsin Film Festival, so I'd like to talk a bit about that. And then second of yeah, all, yeah. would you ever consider coming back here now because you're more of an L.A. resident? Would you come back here and entertain doing a story here or a short here or anything here? Oh my God, I would love to. Yeah, I would absolutely love to. It would be, it would be a dream. I, I would love to. I, I mean, honestly, you know, I think I take a lot of pride in being from Milwaukee and still do. So yeah, I would absolutely love that. Wisconsin Film Festival. What was that experience like? I've never attended, surprisingly. I, that's one I haven't gone to yet. What was that experience like playing there? Yeah, sadly, I didn't attend in person either, but I was so happy to play it my dad and stepmom went because they live in madison so they or i'm sorry they live just outside madison so they went to the screening and they said it was great and you know had had a lot of support and then we played in front of a feature i don't remember the feature now but yeah i heard it was amazing and i heard like really great things they were super supportive and it was the first festival i played back home in wisconsin so that was awesome oh that Um, is that's super neat it is okay so before we get off of Wisconsin, if you could be in a room with one person, you could only pick one. That would be Aaron Rodgers or Giannis. Who would it be and why? It's got to be Aaron. But uh, ah. just because, yeah, just because he's, I don't know, he's, he's towards the end of his career. And it's just, he's such a fascinating person. I still, I still am a big supporter of his, even though there's been stuff in recent news that some people aren't. But like, I think he's yeah. so fascinating. Uh, yeah. And I think where he's at in his career is, is in incredibly interesting because he's probably got three four years left but he's um at the top of his game which is kind of crazy yeah oh yeah I don't disagree with that actually I never used to like watching football at all I never understood it in recent years I've really started watching Aaron Rodgers actually I'm actually gaining an appreciation for him which I never used Mm -hmm. to have which is kind of nice speaking of interesting experiences and careers etc you're a whole 30 years old and you've done things already like worked for HBO Max Sundance and Tribeca Film Festival wow That's a whole lot in 30 years. So (laughs) I I honestly want to talk a bit about that because you've been to places where people are like, oh my gosh, I'd love to do this or I dream of this, et cetera. So tell me a bit about that experience. And second of all, how did you get into the doors of these places and get them to notice you? Yeah, it's kind of a loaded answer because there's just a lot of time in between all of those. But essentially I started working in the film festival uh, world uh, on the production side, just working as, you know, theater managing and line managing and venue managing and all that kind of stuff and for me it kind of fell in my lap it was a friend of mine from Milwaukee actually she hooked me up with a job with the Mill Valley Film Festival and that was my first film festival that I worked up in the Bay Area and Mm -hmm. I love I love that festival still to this day and then how it kind of works is that they're they all work the same festivals all those people and the people the people that you may work with at this festival they're the hiring managers at, you know, Tribeca or Sundance. And I remember doing Mill Valley and I thought it was going to be production jobs like here in LA that I was used to, where you kind of have to fight for your jobs. People aren't going to offer them to you. You got to really like hustle for it. And I remember after working Mill Valley, someone was just like, so are you going to think about doing Tribeca and Sundance? I'm like, what do you mean? And they're like, oh, well, you know, like we're all going there. You should, you should come. I just didn't know that it was that 
easy. So luckily I was around really terrific people that cared about me and wanted me to work at those jobs. And I kind of, I'm out of the festival game, you know, uh, in recent years, but I really appreciated the openness of being able to see the festival light in all regards, you know, from an operation standpoint, from a programming standpoint, and now I'm getting to see it as a filmmaker. So it's really awesome. But yeah, I, I really like, for example, with Tribeca, it's like, those festivals, they're all in different capacities. So there, I think I was doing like line managing or something. And then Sundance, I was doing artist relations. So that was really informative for me with the short films. And that experience with, within its own was probably the best for me as a filmmaker, because I got to literally work, you know, hand in hand with filmmakers that were up and coming and had shorts at the festival. Sure. So I could learn from them and I'm still you know, some of the filmmakers I'm closest with today, that's how I met them. One of my executive producers is how I'm, that's how I met him. So you never know how this stuff's going to work out in the end. But I knew then I said, not as though it was like, I thought about it from a leverage standpoint, I completely thought about it, like just building relationships and becoming, right. I wanted to become, uh, you know, friends with these people and get to know how they did it. How did they do their journey? So I can try and do the same as a filmmaker, Absolutely. you know, you bet. Yeah. Yesterday, I was talking to a filmmaker about this, so I'll talk about the same thing in a different vein with you, um, because I like to teach filmmakers while they're watching these interviews. People talk a lot about film festivals, and everybody who knows anything about it already understands that Sundance and Tribeca's and Cannes are the big top dogs. So yeah. even though this answer might be obvious, I'd like you to address it. Talk to me as both a filmmaker and a person who's worked there. What is really the major difference between the top tier and the regular festivals and why both are important. Yeah, I mean, this is super important. And I think you're only going to learn these things by experiencing them truthfully, because I think the so the narrative we're all told as filmmakers is you got to play those festivals. Those are the gatekeepers. Those are the big ones. And if you don't, you're you kind of got to you know figure out another way. And to a degree, that's very true. They will open up doors for you and they will you know, put, propel you to other festivals. And there's, once you start getting on the circuit, you realize that there's so many festivals out there from the rest of the year that are just what I like to call offshoots of those main festivals, meaning they just program what those festivals programmed sure. uh, for the most part. And I know filmmakers that, you know, we used to tell our filmmakers at Sundance, you should never have to pay for a submission fee after playing here because you should just be getting invites after Sundance. And that's not always true, obviously, but you know, that's, it, it's, it is a big deal and it's huge. Now, as a filmmaker, I haven't played those giant festivals. I haven't played Tribeca Sundance or South by as a filmmaker. Right. So I, I've had to, I've had to navigate that very differently. And I've had to like figure out my way of how am I going to go about this? How am I going to, you know, be able to get more opportunities not having played those festivals. So with that being said, which is true that they are kind of gatekeepers, there are terrific festivals that will triumph films for different ways and different reasons. And you can have your own great festival run and get, you know, the attention your film deserves and hopefully other opportunities from them. My executive producer tells this story all the time, but it's true. He executive produced the Oscar winning short skin that was like four years ago, I think now. Mm -hmm. And he always tells the story that that didn't get into Tribeca, it didn't get into Sundance, it didn't get in anywhere, but it got into Holly Shorts, funny enough. And it won Holly Shorts and then from there went on to win an Academy Award. So you just never know, you know, I don't think the aspirations for every filmmaker is, should be to win an Oscar, obviously, but you just sure. never know what's going to happen with your festival run. And these days, there's so much great exposure with festivals i mean truly I, I feel like holly shorts we're kind of like halfway through our festival run mm -hmm. but holly shorts has given us great exposure you know sure. we've gotten re reviews out of holly shorts that i didn't expect and stuff so you just you just also never know these festivals that right now are a big deal and they 
there's not just one path. And that's kind of been really nice because it gets frustrating when those big oh, festivals don't accept you, you know? Absolutely. I hear that time and time yeah, again, yeah. of course. And I like to brag about Holly Shorts. I've never covered them before. This is my first year. So I have to say oh, it was wow. refreshingly interesting. I mean, it's been very yeah, yeah. inspiring. And moreover, I mean, I didn't realize there were 400 films. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so I tend to tell filmmakers, which is the truth. Before I started the festival, I looked at every single film and I chose you so i basically chose you out of a list of 400 people i picked the films that i thought i could relate to i thought i would enjoy oh, thank you. some that were out of the out of the gate and elevate made the cut which is fortunate but we should give some good props so as a filmmaker and more so as a person just a regular average guy what would you tell somebody about holly shorts why would you recommend their festival oh it kind of goes into what i what i just said about you know the whole run and all that is that it gives you good exposure. Now I played there in 2020 yes. and it was virtual. So that kind of sucked uh, for everyone, <laughs> obviously not just for me, but you know, that was kind of took away the in-person experience. So I feel like I'm not an alumni, even though I guess I am. So this is my first in-person with them. And why I recommend them is just because they care about the outside stuff that doesn't pertain to just like playing your film, meaning they care about interacting you with other filmmakers. They care about the panels they have they have you know a bunch of parties and mixers and stuff yep. and they also give you full access to their online platform and right. this is coming from now on this festival run it's been really i'll say interesting because i don't want to throw shade on certain festivals but, but it's been interesting to see how different festivals operate as far as their communication yes. as far as you know what they cater to with with filmmakers how do they you know interact with you you want to feel supported Right. At the end of the day. Absolutely. Yeah, you know. I agree. You yeah. betcha. Yeah. So I want to switch a little bit because I know in your past you've done things such as uh, music and, and web videos. So question relative to this, because ironically, I just saw something on MTV the other day and it made me laugh because I'm 53. I'm not 30. So I remember <laughs> MTV when they used to have all those music videos, etc. Yeah, so yeah. as a person who's done things like that, just talk to me about the production of music videos in terms of when you're doing a film, you have a script and you have certain things you're looking to do and you accomplish versus a music video has different goals and things to accomplish. So talk about your time doing that and moreover, what's the main difference for you in, in creating both? Well, to be fair, I haven't actually done a music video in a long time, but it was, it was kind of a way that, you know, I started just kind of getting my reps up as far as like figuring out directing and all that. And, and that was, it was really dope. It was great, but I would love to do more. I actually do love doing music videos, you know, on sure. a bigger level I would love to well, actually it doesn't it wouldn't matter the level as long as I can you know eat from it that'd be great but um <laughs> as far as the approach I actually feel as though it's very similar and I guess I haven't thought about it that till now where I always try to tell some kind of story with it also right you know so it's all it's still a visual component I I love the music videos that do tell stories also and I've always tried to be aware of that and approaching it from a narrative sense now obviously the preparation isn't the same and and all that because you're not using sound right so that that's kind of a different component and there's not really depending on the video there's not really performances per se like acting performances but i personally on a on a fundamental level feel as though music is so instrumental to storytelling and movies in general so it's always a big proponent and component of the storytelling process so i love it i love it and i would i would love to get back into it honestly well look at that see so if anybody's yeah, watching yeah. this interview today that's where you hire dylan to do that because he's actually please. qualified please do <laughs> he's like absolutely <laughs> you bet so moving on to environment obviously you live in los angeles well technically it's is it la or is it you're outside in orange county or am i mistaken no i'm in la yeah i moved okay. here to orange i moved to orange county originally but that's no. what i thought yeah. okay so we always like to mm -hmm. check in with filmmakers everybody's familiar with california but then you think california you think hollywood and there and i believe there is a division i've been there so i know orange county is different from la etc right and right. you're a young guy talk to me a bit about living in a world where there's a sea of competition there's obviously a million directors and writers and actors there etc talk to me a bit about that and your choice to choose California versus another state? God, it's such a great question because it, it's something that still weighs on my brain. You know, I truly believe that in my heart of hearts, LA is not like 
the best city for who I am, which it, it doesn't really have a lot of communal aspects that I love. It's not like people aren't really always the type that I, I want to be around. You know, it's all, the industry has that weird effect on people. Obviously, it's very self-centered in that way. But at the end of the day, I've become invested in it so much that now where I'm at, I was just talking about this with my friend last night. So it's interesting that you bring it up. I would love to live in New York at some point in my life, but I right now don't think that could that could happen you know um so with that being said la is terrific for the opportunities obviously it's great but also like you said the competitiveness it's hard it's really hard and i still think about it for sure but i think the at the end of the day this city will give you opportunities that can help you but it also will steer, try and steer you in the wrong direction so you just have to really stay true to who you are and I think it's all it, it's all a journey to becoming your your truest self and who you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to do. And it's it chews a lot of people up and spits them out, too. I've seen a lot of people come out here and then move back home. And that's totally fine. But, uh, you know, I think that you need to really focus on what you came out here to do. And luckily, I don't you know do a lot of things well in my life. But for some reason, I've always known what I wanted to do. So the journey of getting there is weird. You know, it's, it's, there's zigs and zags as normal, you know, when yeah. you pursue what you love, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, I, you could talk about it for hours. It's really, interesting. <laughs> oh, I know. it really is. It really is interesting, but I would say for anyone coming out, you just have to know exactly what you want. I don't know if coming out here to, to just figure it out is the best way. I mean, maybe some people do, I say you should come here with a purpose. What do you want out of it? What do you What are you trying to gain? You know, or it was become, interesting. You know, well, I just spoke to an actor the other day, and he had <laughs> uh, he had this lovely interpretation of how it is in in Los Angeles, which is to say that he's like, you know, you work and you struggle and you hustle, and then all of a sudden you get what you're looking for, or you work towards what you want, you finally get it, and then before you know it, that shiny little light dissipates, and then it's on yeah. to the next person. That's always the fear, I think, for a lot of people, and I mean, that's why I yeah. do what I do, you know, because you have a pretty big light on you right now, and if I do my job properly, that light will stay on even after this project, because I feel for filmmakers. I think it's it's hugely difficult to be in a sea, even in New York. I mean, it's, it's tough. The bigger yeah. the city, the bigger the competition, but you definitely stand out make no mistake not just because you're from Milwaukee but the film you stand <laughs> out trust me um, well thank you so much and I think sure, that's just sure. a, to, just to touch on that that's uh, what you have to believe in you have to believe that your work will speak for itself but it's hard yes. to remember that especially when you're trying to pay rent and all that it, it, oh, you know, yeah. it doesn't always go that way uh, yeah, you're you just like, is this really what I should be doing you know it's, it's obviously you know to think that yeah, so folks, if you're hearing this, if you're like a director, an actor, if you're in the arts and you're starting out, yeah, get the side shuffle and don't drop it right <laughs> yeah. away. Even if you right. got to deliver pizzas or newspapers or whatever, you got to get the side shuffle or the day job or whatever have you for a bit. Yep. Okay, so let's talk about your various jobs. First of all, I wanted to look to the producer side of things. Oftentimes when I talk to audiences, a lot of them don't really comprehend. You think producer, you think money. That's a given, right? Mm -hmm. So I want you to talk a bit about what the lure to producing is outside of the obvious. Yes, we all get you get a say within the movie, but why do you want to be a producer? What does that, what does that really mean? Why is that important to a film? Probably one of those credits, and I think the HBO Max thing, which actually I guess I didn't answer that part of your question. The <laughs> HBO Max thing, I fell into that job. So that job was actually more of a flex, like assistant kind of job and like sure. office manager. And then when I got into post, I, they realized that I could help editing and stuff and help with like the real. So the story producing was just, you know, getting these clips together and sending them to the editors. And then I kind of nicely asked them for a, a story producing credit which they gave me. So that was nice. But producing, I got to be honest, I don't think about producing that much, you know, and I have been more recently. I think with these last projects, I've been asked more by friends or whoever to like possibly help with a short or something. And it's just a nice muscle that I'm not used to flexing, which is supporting someone else's vision. If you're a true, like, my, okay, I'll say it like this. My favorite producers to work with are ones who support filmmakers visions now there's a time and place to obviously you know voice your opinion if you don't think you know sure. things are going right and all that but if you if you think about the definition of a producer at least in the film world it really is to support 
the director's vision to bring it to life. My favorite producers also not only are great people, but they do a great job of not letting me see all the bullshit that they have to deal with. You know, for example, paperwork or, you know, equipment runs yeah. and stuff like that. And they, and, the, and then you ask them, oh, I didn't even know you did that. And they go, well, yeah, I want you to focus on what you have to focus on, the performances and the story and that stuff. And that's great. That is the most supportive way. So I think if you want to be part of that filmmaking process and you really want to support filmmakers, but you don't think of yourself necessarily as one, actually, I shouldn't say that because obviously you can do both, but for producing in particular with film, if you want to complement a director's vision and you feel like you can bring it to life and you can help them get their vision on screen, then you should do it. I mean, at the end of the day, we all do this because we love it, you know, and I, and I think the shared passion, I shouldn't say we all do it because we love it. <laughs> I don't know everyone, but I don't know everyone's intentions, but I would say yeah. that you really, that those are the best people to work with, the ones where sure. you share that passion and then you go, oh, this is incredible because we have that shared love for movies and wanting to make something great that you know you want to you want to make something great and so yeah that's what I would say if, if you're wanting to go into that okay now shifting over to the actor side two questions to that <clears throat> first of all I'm sure you've heard this before that you got a face for acting because people say that sometimes like he's a looker he's got a face for acting so I've for never one, heard that actually so you got yourself a face for acting and moreover well, someone that you. isn't me and is about your age was like oh he's really cute and an actor is he single because I had to ask and we're here. So thank you. I wish. No, I am single. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an actor though. <laughs> but you are an actor according to your IMDb because there's two credits on there. Oh, uh, those aren't real acting credits. <gasps> there's a background. I'm also being a little facetious. It is, they are acting credits, but what happens, I'll tell you the story on those. What happens when you do back? Like I was doing background when I first moved out here a lot, doing extra work. And what happens if you're in a featured role, they would give you an IMDb credit because if you're in a featured role. So it would be yeah. like, I think one of them's like laughing student or, you know, whatever. So they are on my IMDb and they yes, are they technically are. acting roles, but they're not real in my opinion. Like they're not actually like, oh, I, you know, got this job and it was great. You know, it was like, sure. oh, they just flexed my position and actually gave me a credit because I was heavily featured or something, you know. I gotcha. No, I understand. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so the real big thing for you is, of course, writing and directing. I see you've done five projects each for both, or alternatively together, I should say. So I have a couple questions relative to that. First of all, if you could be stuck in a room doing anything all day long, and you can pick one, which is it, the writing or the directing, and why? Yeah, wow, that's tough. I think the answer would be directing, but with that being said, I feel it. I've only wanted to write, not because I love writing but because I think it was necessary for the best way to get my vision on screen. Sure. I always felt as though writing was kind of a necessity. I've grown to kind of love it as I've, you know, worked on it a lot more, but I've always kind of just, you know, as I've gotten older and more versed in film and, and uh, found my own sensibility, I've just learned that like, my favorite films are ones by writers and directors, and it's more of a singular vision. So I kind of realized early on that I had to write. So I didn't really, you know, think of it necessarily as two separate entities. Okay, I understand. But but if, it, if I had to choose, yeah, I guess directing. I like doing I that more. <laughs> okay, that's all right. On the yeah. directing side of things, and I know that you're strong skilled with this, please talk to me a bit about what you feel you could use improvement on because all of us are not perfect, clearly. And so there's mm -hmm. always room to fix something. So if, I, if you did a little self-assessment, where do you think you need to grow a little bit? In directing in particular? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. That is such a good question. It's such a good self-assessment. I try to do that after every project. Like what nice. can I get better at? And and in particular, it's like whatever with the film that, that I felt like could be tweaked here and there. I think I can, I can honestly, it, it, I actually believe this is kind of a loaded answer, but I actually believe most of the problems for a film when they don't work is due to the writing. So I actually want to sharpen my writing more than my directing. But with directing, I would say, even though I think I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it, is communicating with actors. I, I think you can always get better at the way you communicate with actors. And sure. it's a skill that I always want to work on 
again, I actually feel competent in it, but I think you can always get better in like, you know, less is more, not having to say too much, especially working on this one with like pretty experienced actors. I was realizing that like, oh, I don't have to over talk. We don't have to over talk about this, you know? So yeah, trying to be more effective in communication with actors, I think. That makes sense. And it's a good answer. So let's take a look at Elevate as an example. You're both the writer and the director on there. Would it be fair to say that you can be objective? Because there are some directors that I know, like sometimes if they're an actor and the director, they struggle with one or the other. So alternatively, when it comes to the writer and the director, at what point is you being the writer? At what point do you have to stop yourself and say, oh, no, 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 no. Director Dylan over here has to take precedence. And if he wants to change this in the writing area, he can't. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, that's really important. Again, I think they're both the same. I, I treat them kind of the same in, in my process. So like, really? I'm always rewriting. I mean, I'm always in, in the sense where, you know, I'll give you a quick story on that. We, you know, there was a scene in the film that didn't really work when we were trying to shoot it. And like, we couldn't figure out why. And I, and I, quickly realized it was, you know, the writing of the scene. And we just, I rewrote it after the, after the first shooting day, we pushed it to the second day. I rewrote it that, that night. I rewrote that scene, which was kind of, I I know it's annoying for the actors because I, then I keep sending them new updated scripts all the time. Right. Yeah. So I rewrote that scene and we then shot it again differently in a different location in in the building where the film takes place and it works. So I actually truly believe that you have to treat filmmaking like a living organism at all times. It's always evolving and always changing because if you fight it, it's going to, you know, consume you and it, and oh, it sure. won't end up well. You have to embrace it and try to change it. Like then I remember we were scouting. It didn't, it didn't always take place in a government building. That was a building that we found. So I rewrote it to be in a government building. Right. Sure. So I, I just, I think they, they go hand in hand in my okay. process, at least, you know. All right. Well, before yeah. we start talking about the film itself, I have one more question. Again, a teaching yeah. question relative to a lot of times when I speak to writers, they're excited to make movies, but they honestly have no idea the text as it relates to actual screenwriting, because there are some mm. writers that'll say, oh, you don't need a screenplay format, da, 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 da. So tell me just a bit about that in terms of when you put a screenplay together, if you would advise anyone who is watching this, if they want to go out and put together a movie, do they have to use a screenplay template? Do they have to put it in a certain format? How do you feel about that? It is amazing that you just asked this. I have this book literally sitting next to me right now. <laughs> it's called The Anatomy of Story. See? It's a phenomenal book by John Truby. So I'll say that with two parts. Okay. That this book is not a book that like a lot of like screenwriters talk about, or like, you know, uh, it's not like a Sid Field, you know, three act structure book or save the cat, which I think is horrible. I think save the cat is a joke. But with that being said, filmmaking is an art form. There's no, there's not a formula to it, but that's why I love this. The title of this book, the anatomy of story. There is an essential, there are essential elements to storytelling. And that's what this book talks about. It's like, the the essential elements so i think if you're getting it and i had to learn this you know my own way there are some people out there that believe oh it's about they are believed to the three-act structure they believe to format and, and all that and that's fine but i can point to so many films that don't subscribe to that that are phenomenal right so when you start watching movies you start realizing oh it's not necessary and it's not you don't it's kind of one of those things with directing also you do not need to have rules for all this it's nice to know the rules when you're breaking them sure Um, but but that's pretty much that's pretty much all i I, I, all i would care about i think if you're going to get into screenwriting that book's phenomenal i would always recommend that but also just learn it's just like any craft you got to learn by doing it and you got it i mean i was i remember when i first was writing shorts and scripts i would send them to people that were a lot more experienced than me and they would just be like i don't know this yeah i don't get it i don't know so you know the the reality is that you're going to be bad at something when you first start it for the most part you know and and i think everyone especially nowadays is expecting to be great at it and expecting to have this instant gratification and instant results of like you know oh i'm gonna make my first film and it's gonna be great and it's gonna you know be a really good story the best way to learn is by doing it. Like, like Kubrick said, you, you really, the best way to be a filmmaker is by doing it. But to the screenwriting aspect, it's the most important in my opinion too. So you, you really got to nail that down in, in, in my estimation, 
mm-hmm. the nine times out of ten when something's wrong with a film like i said it, it's because of the script have you utilized some of the templates that are out there or do you have a go-to standard template you use when you put it in format just curious this is just kind of a sidebar a little bit i heard pta paul thomas anderson on on an interview where he was talking mm-hmm. about that he still uses microsoft word for his scripts Oh my. Or he only uses my, which is hilarious. And then he'll send it to someone who puts it in like screenwriting format, sure. uh, which I thought was so funny. But I think what that highlights is that you don't necessarily need to be, you know, working with final draft. I work with a program called Celtics, C E L T X. And it's just been on my laptop forever. So I'm too lazy to like <laughs> <laughs> figure it out with final cut or do something different. So, you know, I just, um, I've just been riding that into the ground. I think it's actually, I think they actually make people pay for it now. So I still have the free program, but. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Free is yeah. always good in this industry. Free. Speaking of which, that's okay, so let's, it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's get to Elevate. So Elevate is 15 yeah. minutes long. I know that it was made in 2020 and I know that you have an approximation budget. Um, we always like talk about budget in one degree or another. So it's an estimated of $30,000. So that's clearly mm-hmm. not free. I know some friends that make films for free and I love right, them right, to right. death because they can do it. So $30,000 without giving too much away, because I never like to give too much away of the story. I looked at your story. And I thought to myself, as a person, I, it would be easy for me to say $30,000, that's an awful lot of money. Because really, mm-hmm. when you look at your film, realistically, I counted five locations. I mean, I know what's all the, you know, the building, etc. Mm-hmm, but I'm like, mm-hmm. you know, different places. So then I'm like, okay, so explain to the lay person, because some people are lay people that aren't in the industry, talk a bit about why it was necessary to have that kind of budget. And moreover, would you have been more comfortable adding on, let's say maybe 50 grand, going to 50 grand with this? Of course. I mean, God, more money is always, sure. I mean, especially on that level, of course, I would have taken the extra 20. Was it needed? No, probably not. I think, I think we got, it felt really, you know, comfortable. And that, so the story, the, the um, discussion of budget, especially when it pertains to this film is actually and need to give the context for my other films where this is the biggest budget I've ever had. I've never had a budget over five grand really before this. Oh, wow. So okay. I've always kind of made my films run and gun, very, you know, stretching everything, doing calling favors, you know, doing that. Right. And I, I became really fortunate with working up to the way to the point where more people wanted to invest in the film and, you know, we able to have a, a comfortable budget. Uh, and 30, honestly, you know, you, you ask experienced producers and cinematographers like my own 30 for a short is these days, it's not even that much. I, I used to think that at, uh, when I, we, when I was coordinating for filmmakers at Sundance, I used to think I would hear their budgets of 30, 40 grand. I was like, why the hell would you need that much for a short film? But now I get it. And now I understand it's not that crazy of a number anymore. So with that being said, cast was, they were super awesome and they pretty much did it for virtually nothing where it goes to is you know all of the above the i mean locations would would probably be your basic biggest expense depending on where your film sure. takes place but for this it was the locations you know the gear all we wanted to make sure we had pretty much all crew department as well uh, you know costume wardrobe makeup you know production designer all that so you know it's just amazing how it fills up. But again, it does go, you know, you want to have good catering. You want to make sure you have enough people that's supporting on the production side, the first AD, you know, I know it kind of sounds like a boring cliche answer that it goes to all that, but it adds up so quickly you forget. And then you, I, I would go back to the Excel spreadsheet of our budget and I'd be like, Oh my God, how did it add up this quick? But it does. Obviously you, you try to make tweaks all the time. You try to like, what can we cut here? What can we save here? Sure. But coming from, doing really small micro budgets i understood what everyone was talking about now with having this comfortable budget i could finally focus on stuff that i needed to focus on it was this was the first shoot i didn't worry about any equipment pickup or do any on my own i didn't need to worry about moving gear moving you know catering and all that kind of stuff and that was the stuff i was always doing on my own because you know, I didn't have the money to, to do anything else. Right. So Understood. this was incredible to just show up and everyone else, everything else that you used to worry about was pretty much taken care of. And I just got to worry about performance and the, the scene and whatever is 
happening that day. And that was terrific. I, I loved that part of it. Obviously, there's times where, you know, more issues pop up, but I think that is that was my biggest takeaway and relief for sure. And should we let everybody know that, of course, the director makes thousands of dollars when they make movies, correct? <laughs> I would have not made a single <laughs> penny on any short film I've made. Yeah. Well, oh, I'm right. sorry. I'll take that back. In the initial stages, you don't. And, and like right. you you may with licensing. I have absolute sure. license a short, but that's also nothing, really. I, I know friends of mine that have licensed their shorts to HBO Max, and it's still, you know, not as much as you think. But it's not. It's still great but the answer is the answer is no for okay. shorts especially <laughs> so that's called passion folks that's when we yeah, do it because exactly. we have a passion for things and we're all on, yeah. on board with the whole passion thing okay so the yeah. film itself so to give everyone a small introduction there's this lovely beautiful actress who plays the role of tiffany and we get an introduction to tiffany and she's quite lovely she's very sweet to everyone that she meets. she's very helpful she's very accommodating and she comes across various what i call characters within the course of her work day because she's a security guard at a government building. So mm -hmm. we're going to talk a bit about Tiffany. I know the actress. I'm relatively familiar, I think, with one of her other projects. So Tiffany, when you were putting her role together, how important was it that she not only be friendly and big hearted, but more importantly, so aware of her surroundings? To me, one of the things that stands out about Tiffany is that she's always aware of what's going on almost behind her and in front of her all at the same time. Mm, wow that's that's very uh, what, what, observational what Ob observational yeah 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 <laughs> yes that is incredible no that's really nice I've never heard anyone uh, make that observation I again it kind of went to the writing of it I really wanted to have a character who again when you realize who she encounters it's this great balance and we needed I needed someone like that to counter what she was experiencing with this person that she meets on the rooftop so it kind of it was influenced like by one of the people i worked with at this production company the security guard she so it was like loosely uh, like inspired by her and she was very sweet and like nice every time we came mm -hmm. in the building it was also just understanding that i wanted someone who took pride in their work you know and and instead of like hating the slug and the grind of a nine to five at a you know kind of a blue collar job in a way I wanted someone who, who really enjoyed that. And also now I didn't know Tracy Toms, who's this actress you're talking about. What's funny right. enough, it's her birthday today, actually. Hey, Tracy, um, happy birthday. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know her personally, but I just could, seeing her work and all that, I knew she could do that and portray that. And it kind of felt like that was kind of part of who she was, which sure. was was true. And she is that kind of person not taking anything away from her performance. I think that was just something that she can channel. She is so great at making people feel comfortable when they're around her. That's something now I've, I've learned more as we've gone on the festival circuit together and become mm -hmm. better friends, but she's so great at making people feel comfortable. And that's something that I think Tiffany, the character I wanted, I really just wanted someone who you feel her sense of empathy and compassion coming off the screen. Okay. Now, and it starts from that first action. Sorry. That's oh, absolutely. No, absolutely. Yeah. And again, I, I try to be elusive because I don't want people to figure out everything because otherwise, if you know the whole story, why would you want to go see the movie? So we want to leave sure. some allure here. One of the characters that she comes across is an individual, and we get the impression that it's probably a homeless individual who happens to be outside of the building. So again, mm -hmm. another interpretation because I do film reviews, so I interpret a lot. So my question to you is, yeah. does the homeless individual represent the fact that desperation requires kindness is that what that's representative of because at first i couldn't figure out why is this homeless person it, it wasn't adding up and i could be misinterpreting but why the integration of the homeless individual so when i told you about that scene that i was trying to figure out where it yeah. fit that's the scene i was uh, we were trying to figure out and we had and it was written differently where it was more suspenseful originally okay. on the script where it was like Oh, she sees something on the camera and you don't know what it is and it was like kind of a little foreshadowing to what, what she actually encounters mm -hmm. and then i just realized i was like that was that, the the story in the film was telling me that that wasn't right and not only wasn't it right it just felt like you know too heavy-handed you know and i was what i wanted was like tiffany to learn a lesson on the theme which is you know uh class 
And I wanted her to t- kind of take away a lesson of class from, um, I also wanted it specifically to be a woman, a homeless woman to kind of maybe empathize more with her. Tiffany would empathize more with her. But I, I think really na- then how it evolved was more so just becoming part of her routine. And that's kind of what we leaned into. And that's why it's more of a shorter scene now. And it's only yes. done in one shot. Right. So it really, yes, I think there are ties to the theme, which is class. And it could foreshadow that a little bit, like the people on the ground level of the lower class system, you know, with the higher class system. I think that's kind of more what it's hinting at before you really meet the person she meets right afterwards. But if you're just watching it, I think it ends up really just becoming part of her routine that you understand that she probably has to deal with this on a nightly basis, if not, you know, weekly. You betcha. And as she meanders, obviously, throughout the day while she's at work, she encounters certain things, experiences, of course. Another interpretation, which came across to me was, it's interesting how the filmmaker and writer both, it's not just about how it was directed, but also about how it's written. I thought it interesting. I automatically honestly thought of Hollywood. I was like, everybody goes in front of a camera and always looks and acts a certain way. And they're taught that this is how, you know, we as humans are always taught. If someone asks you if you're okay, of course, I'm okay. I'm all right. Thanks for asking. It's never, I'm awful. I'm terrible. I'm miserable. I mean, unless you're me, because lately I really have done. (laughs) I feel like shit. I am. But thank you for asking. You know, (laughs) so there's almost as if a forced facade is really the norm in society. So I was wondering, is that one of the messages that you were trying to put forth within the course of the film? I can't say that it was at the forefront of my mind but I actually believe it's one of the essential parts of storytelling we're all actors to a degree portraying you know versions of ourselves that we want to give to the world and some of those are very on rarest occasions they're our truest selves but most of the time we're portraying personas of what we want to be uh, not really who we are sure I heard this quote from uh, I think it was Aaron Sorkin he was talking about writing and he was like Don't write what your character, uh, your dialogue should not reveal character. It should reveal who your character thinks they are, which I think was really interesting because it, it, at its core, yeah, okay, dialogue reveals who your character is. No, but it also, but it really reveals who your character thinks that they are because we all think that we're this thing. And most of the time, it doesn't add up to who we truly are. I mean, that's why American Beauty is one of my favorite films. It's, it's, that's No that's, surprise that's there. Core, yeah. <laughs> so, Paul, I have to say, mm-hmm. I love Paul. I really do. I mean, the, the oh, casting great. choice is super good, first of all. Because, I, I mean, as a person, not the movie reviewer, the first time I saw him, like, I'm thinking, what the hell? And again, I'm not going to give it away because, like, you get introduced to Paul's character, and I'm just mm-hmm. like, what the hell? And as you're going on, I'm still like, what? All this time I'm thinking, this is not normal. Beh-. Like people just don't do this, you know? I mean, his, mm. and I'll give you just tidbits, folks. Paul's behavior is very out of the ordinary. The way he's presented in the story is out of the ordinary. His attitude, behavior, mannerisms, all very different. So the gentleman who plays Paul, I'd like to ask this question. When you met him, for some reason in my head, I seem to feel like you almost told him to act the exact opposite of what you wanted to get the result you wanted. Does that make sense? <laughs> I guess it does. But the actor, Jason Butler Harner, is such a good actor and he's yes. so terrific that I, did, I didn't have to do any manipulation sure. like that. But I understand why, why you'd say that because, I, you know, sometimes to, to get what you want, you have to kind of go a back channel way yes thank you for saying that about the casting and that's kind of the the thing i will take take pride in with that because obviously we had people that we thought were ideal for the role and or i put put together a few names that i think would be great but something i wanted to hone in on was i really wanted an actor that you could feel his internal struggle just by his expressions on his face and not this big performative way because like you alluded to he's going through a lot of internal conflict but i wanted you to be able to see that just by seeing into his eyes and looking at his face and knowing that right and that that is what i aimed for but then it's another thing to take it where jason took it where i think you know his performance is just so unbelievable because even tracy at times when we were doing setups of, of certain one scene in particular she came up to me and she's like jason huh like oh my god like 
there, we were getting other uh, people that you know pas and stuff that were coming up to me and be like man he was unbelievable and i think it's a tough tough role and it, it, it seems similar it, I mean, i'm sorry <laughs> not similar it seems easy on the surface yes. but when you think about everything that he's going through and to and to really hold it together while being in front of tiffany and the, the context with everything it's it's hard to pull that off and make it believable i was really impressed with his, how he internalized it all and i think that's always more fascinating to me on, on screen i don't want to see characters and actors who tell you exactly what they're thinking at all times because that's not how sure. that's not human behavior to me so oh, you bet even yeah. in my notes here, I've got, you know, obviously not only can you see his pain, but, you know, again, back to the good storytelling, there are lines that he has provided that allude to various things. So it's it, it's hinting at, but it's never really giving the secret away, so to speak, as far as that goes. And folks, mm -hmm. when you watch the movie, you're going to watch that they would, you know, for the little time they start building a, a trust between one another. He, Let me take you here. Let's do this, et cetera. And so they're actually getting to know one another. And you can see that the wall is kind of coming down for even just a small bit as far as that goes, which I thought was right, so right. fascinating. And then again, because I can't tell too much, clearly there's a point in which Paul and Tiffany's character end the day. Mm -hmm. So I'll ask this question with hope, without anyone hopefully figuring this out. Filmmakers who use their products to make note of something so significant is hugely impressive. Obviously you do that. Some of us who watch the movie catch on probably easier than others because we've been there, myself mm -hmm. included. So why was it so significant that you use storytelling to send a seriously important message? Well, thank you so much. Uh, simple answer is I think that's what it's all about. That's that's all I care about uh, when it comes to filmmaking. That's that's the only reason I do it. At the end of the day, is to have an impact on people's lives, and I think that's what what art is for. And I think you're given yeah. a talent or a gift to tell stories, to do something in art. It, it's a gift for other people. I don't. It should never be self serving. So I'm always I'm always thinking about how can I talk about something that I have a point of view on, but also that can maybe help people that are dealing with that similarly. And it's hard in this one because it doesn't, I mean, it's not, this is not a spoiler at, at, at all, I don't think, but it's just, you don't expect a happy ending. <laughs> um, but with that being said, I think the most impactful films, and for me at least, aren't the happiest endings. So I hope that people walk away from it, you know, moved in some way, but don't feel like you're ever going to, you're going to get closure or you're going to get any type of like, resolution because <laughs> you're not but uh yeah that's the answer it that it's that is the only reason i do it I, I think that is so important i don't i don't think it's necessary for all films i don't think all filmmakers and films need to have sure. a, a poignant mes message but the most impactful films and the films i want to make are the ones that change you know people's lives for the better so you betcha yeah has anyone ever walked up to you and said did you make this movie purposely have a particular agenda again without saying too much because there are some that believe that you are and, and this would be a good thing by the way i'm not saying that it's mm -hmm. bad meaning that you're trying to remind people of the significance as to why you need to remember this yeah i would change the wording just a little bit i think okay. agenda is a tough a tough yes, word it but is. I, I think and that, it's probably not the right word but no it's totally fine though i know exactly what you mean i would say importance yeah i think there's an importance to it but i don't think i I, I try to stay clear of any agenda driven film. And I think that is so <laughs> apparent when you see yes. a film that has an agenda and you just go, oh, even if I agree with the agenda, I don't want to know, you know, I don't want to know I'm being manipulated that I said this to my dad on the phone. It's like, it's okay that you're manipulating uh, as your audience, but I don't want to know that I'm being manipulated. And that's kind of the, the key. It's like, I, appreciate it and you want to just be transformed and, and sucked into the story so any agenda driven film you know i heard this great quote that was just because your film has a good message doesn't mean it's a good film and i think that you have to remember that too you know you have to remember that too but the answer is yes of course i wanted people to right walk away with it with some type of like like i had a clear point of view on it and i want people to see that point of view 
but also, I mean, I've, I've had a few people come up to me interpret, interpreting the film different than I intended in really cool ways. So, you know, cool. it, it, that's the great power of films also is that people walk away from it. Um, you betcha. You know, yes, in their own way. Absolutely. Yeah. So I just have to ask, yeah. the last scene, mm-hmm. is it, again, interpret, this is my interpretation I would venture to guess that the filmmaker purposely positioned Tiffany exactly where she was in relationship to how the elevator appears. Was that done intentionally to infer something? With again, not telling anyone anything. I know, I know, it's terrible. No, 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 that's not bad at all. No, I'm, I'm literally thinking, of, I think that was a great, that's a great observation. Do you mean you remember, where she right? was in the like, frame? The oh, position, of course. Yeah, I, had to, you I had to that. watch it a million times. Um, yeah, the way you course. frame the shot. If you really look at it closely and the elevator where shot she is, yeah, or the please. zoom. If if you look at the the shot, it appears as though she's a very she's now very small, and the elevator. Yes, of course, very that was large. intended. Yes, 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 yes. That was very really? intentional. Great observation. I'm sorry, I got lost because I thought you were That's talking okay. about the um, <laughs> the zoom shot before that. No, that that, that was in, in te- intentional as hell. It also is, and again, I don't think this spoils anything. This it is also a mirrored shot of when she was in the elevator with Paul. Right. So it's kind of symbolizing that, you know, um, the utilizing the emptiness of the frame too, you know, and, yes. and keeping her in the empty frame. So yeah, that's a great observation. Absolutely. I thought I thought it should. I try to do less is more, you know, and sometimes like yes. it's almost too subtle. I think <laughs> my dad said this about the film. He was like, it's so subtle that I think there's things I didn't even pick up on. Um, <laughs> oh, I agree. Yeah. Definitely. And, uh, obviously oh. there's a balance maybe, but. Balance yeah. is exactly. So yeah. this is the go-to question I always say. So when I'm wrapping up, I'm like, okay. So if you were to ask Cindy, what does the film elevate in three sentences? What is it? And then I'm going to ask you to do the same thing as the filmmaker to describe elevate in only three sentences. This is my interpretation of elevate. Elevate is the story of one woman, actually two women and their relationships together. And then you have the male female relationship. What you're figuring out in the course of this is I almost view the male and female leads as being the personification of kindness, compassion, and empathy. And then on the other side of the fence, or alternatively, the other side of the world is judgment and harshness and criticism and unloved. And when you put the Mm -hmm. two together, you have the perfect balance of the world. And hopefully, Tiffany's side wins out. Wow, that's great. I like that a lot. But I'm not Um, the creator. So the creator is going to tell you what's Elevate. That's so cool. I mean, you know, there's always the like, what is it in the IMDb sense? And then what is it really about? Since you so eloquently put it on that level, I'll go to that level too. Because I don't, I hate saying what it's about in a plot pitch sense, you know. Sure. God, what it really is, it's, I, I look at it like a story about class. And it's a story about two people meeting that are on opposite ends of the, of the spectrum of the class system and how similar they are. And when they have such different worlds, you know, and they're such, they live such different lives, but they're actually quite similar Absolutely. and, uh, and they, and they can get along and, and really, yeah, it is the yin and yang for sure. I think it's that, you know, the compassion, the, uh, the, uh, optimism versus pessimism kind of, kind of thing too. You know, I think that's totally a through line, but I really looked at it too. Like you just, no matter where we're, coming from no matter who we are we share more in common than, than we than we don't and, and we also can use compassion and kindness for for one another that is this is not three sentences that's i was just terrible. gonna cut you off and say <laughs> eh, dylan that's past the three line mark because everyone that's just gets terrible. three sentences and it's a test too i purposely do it because i'm like oh those yeah. filmmakers think they're all that huh now try to describe your film in three sentences and only three it's like having only three shots to do something, you know. Yeah, if yeah, I could only thing. do three sentences, it would be about the class thing, though. I would, I would hone in on that. So, like, Did you get really, that, folks. The class yeah. thing. There you go. It's about, it's about the class system. So we all core. know, of course. I found this film through Holly Short. So now that it's been to Holly Shorts, where is it headed next? So we are playing San Jose Shorts. I don't know when that is. When is that? November? No, October. I don't remember. In when the coming months, um, it's coming up, like in a couple months. Yeah. 
Yeah, San Jose okay. Shorts, and then we're playing Tallgrass, okay. which is Wichita, I believe. So that'll be great. And then just nice. found out literally a couple of days ago, we're playing in the UK at this short festival called Azteca. Azteca, I think it's what you call it. It's back okay. to qualifying. So excited cool. about that. Yeah, that's that's all we got so far. But, you that's know, awesome. we're going to keep keep it going, hopefully. You Absolutely. Know? See what okay. happens. So if you want to know this guy, again, his name, and he's originally from Milwaukee, which is so badass. Dylan and the Represent. last name. Absolutely. B-O-O-M. Uh, he is on IMDb, LinkedIn, Facebook, and his Instagram is D Boom Killa, K-I-L-L-A-H. Any place else where people can find you? No, I think that's it. But it's kind of funny. I've, I've, I've thought about, you know, to be more professional of changing my Instagram handle, but I don't think I'm ever going to change it. <laughs> no surprise there. Oh my gosh. Dylan, thank you so much. Thank, thank you for you. doing this. Thank you for everything. It's been absolutely lovely. No, thank you so much. I hope my shirt didn't look too wrinkled. I realized this no, is like a terrible good. wrinkled shirt to wear. 